welcome so much. My name is Diane Proctor, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters, and it is an enormous pleasure to have you all here. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I want to begin, as, as always, by thanking the people who have made all of this possible. And the, the, the person who's made it most possible is sitting right here in the front row, Laurie Hunter, uh, who helped us to coordinate this and organize this. You're a remarkable lady. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And the committee for the League uh, was, was chaired by the indomitable and always gracious Edie Lipinski. Um, and, and she has, she and Heather and Julie and, and Carlin and the crowd have done a wonderful job of putting this together to bring really a star study cast. All you have to do is to read this list to know what an exceptional team of educators we have uh, working uh, in our community. So Edie is going to start by introducing the event and then I'll just generally moderate from there. Okay. Okay. So good morning and welcome to our first Friday Forum. Uh, my name is Edie Lipinski. I'm the chair of the Education Committee. We are honored to have such an amazing group of educators with us this morning. We welcome the principals from the high school, the middle school, all three elementary schools, our new MECO director, and a counselor from Alcott. They'll share the important work they're doing uh, <clears throat> from kindergarten through 12th grade to create an inclusive and supportive environment for our schools. We also welcome Lori Hunter, our superintendent, who in her short tenure has created a culture of collaboration not only within the administration but across the entire school community. So as a former teacher myself, my first question is, who's watching the kids? <laughs> <laughs> we made some backup plans. <laughs> All the people in charge are here. <laughs> but I think we'll find the answer to that as we listen to the presentation. Because the teachers themselves have embraced and sometimes even developed the programs that we're going to be hearing about in a ground up process that includes even includes feedback from the students. And professional development programs have supported the teachers' learning and growth. So this is something we all appreciate as former teachers, many of us are, um, that that really makes a difference. We'll also learn how the students are being empowered to take responsibility for their own actions through Open Circle. Uh, to seek out mentors through home base, and to also manage the stress of academic achievement through challenge success. So I'm going to hand this over very quickly to Diane Proctor, who's got the timer, and she's going to be, uh, oh, maybe she doesn't, okay. Um, and she'll introduce each of the speakers. If anyone needs a program, just let me know. We'll pass them down. Thank you all. <coughs> Speaking of children, we have a three-year-old granddaughter. She is a petri dish, and I have what she has. <laughs> um, Mike Mastrello, principal of Conger Carlisle High School, will begin. Each of the people's speakers will present for a few moments, um, and then after they sit down, we'll have a chance for a question and answer. Mike, are you there? Thank you, yes. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I, am, I am Mike Mastrello. I am the principal at the high school. And this is a star studded cast. They start with the weakling first, so it, gets, it will grow from here. So I, I have to set the expectations really low, and then they can shine uh, thereafter. So I get to talk very brief. I've been told there's a, a very strict seven minute limit. So I guess you can see I'm timing as you go. Yes, yes, yes right. right. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind counting out loud, it won't distract you at all. Um, and there's, there are a lot of things I could talk about with the high school. Um, really, the, we, we are so thankful for all the community support. and. And, and count the, the League of Women Voters as, as part of those supporters. And I am going to talk a little bit about student stress and student wellness and how we're helping to manage that. Um, but I will say, you know, the kids at the school really are remarkable in, in so many ways. And if you ever get an opportunity to come see a play or come see an art show or come to a sporting event or, you know, just the stuff that's going on daily, the kids are amazing. So what I am talking about is challenge success today, and as you can see, just by the title and the way success is inverted kind of tells you a little bit about what challenge success is in the program. And so this is in partnership with Stanford University. It, it started, they started this um, challenge success, and it has grown. We were one of the uh, first schools to be part of it, and it has grown to a lot of schools um, even in the area. Um, and essentially, it's challenging our definition of success. And 
it is really challenging to be a teenager these days. There's a lot of positive and there's a lot of really challenging things. Academically, the kids are so well prepared. And um, you know, the, the competition to get into, the vast majority of our kids are going to college. And the competition to get into the college is, is really not only national, we're competing against the kids all across the country, but really it's global. And so it is really intense. And the kids in, uh, very much identify themselves um, by where they're going to college, which we're trying to kind of um, to, uh, to recognize, have the kids recognize that it's not about the top 20. There are literally hundreds of schools that they, will, they can find their place and do really, really well. But it's easy as an adult to say that, and it is really hard to get that message to kids. I'm going to make this somewhat interactive. So Challenge Success uh, has a mission statement, and I'm going to call on one of my colleagues. Angel, would you mind reading the Challenge Success <laughs> mission statement? <laughs> Challenge Success partners with schools, families, and communities to embrace a broad definition of success and to implement research-based strategies that promote student well-being and engagement with learning. Excellent. Thank you. And so we have a committee. So it's Concord Carmel High School Committee, and we also have a vision statement. Uh, and would you just... You did so well. Would you mind? <laughs> okay. Concord Carlisle High School is a community united in support of students' engagement and well-being. We consciously commit, one, to spark curiosity and excitement for the journey of the high school experience. Two, to encourage balance, personal growth, and academic excellence. Three, to value student voice as a respectful and compassionate community. And four, to foster a community that actively challenges and redefines success to support students' individual well-being. Yeah, there really is so much um, in that vision statement that is, is really powerful. Um, and starting with, you know, just curiosity and engagement. And, you know, the workload is really rigorous. There is a lot of work to complete in high school. Um, but we find that if the kids are really engaged, just like all of us in our daily lives, if you're engaged and you're enjoying what you're doing, you know, the time passes quite quickly and it doesn't really feel like work. And when it, when it does feel like work and you're not really engaged, you know, that really um, demanding workload can be a challenge and feel arduous at best. So, um, and then student voice is also very important. We have nearly 1,300 kids and oftentimes they have the best ideas. Not always, but oftentimes. Uh, and really getting their voice and getting their opinion on, on how to run the school and, and initiatives that should take place. You know, it's really powerful and the kids, um, you know, they're really thoughtful and have a lot of great ideas. So I'm just going to give you a brief timeline of things that we've done uh, over the past three years. And again, this is really to kind of counteract the student stress that, that, that we know exists. And we're not trying to remove uh, stress. Stress is a natural part of life not only coping mechanisms, um, but also trying to dampen it down a little bit. Because it, it is really challenging to be a teenager, and that extends far beyond um, what happens within the, you know, the four walls of the school. And you know, they're, oftentimes they're very busy and involved in things they really love, which is great. But we also have to deal with now this, you know, a phone and technology and, and these social media and really things that we didn't have to grow up with. Oh. Oh. So, in closing, uh, no. I'll be really quick, I promise. Okay, so. Uh, that out in advance. Yeah. So, you can imagine, let's say you have six, six classes in a day, and each class gave 45 minutes to an hour of homework a night. Not, it's not doable, right? And that's not only um, not doable, but homework in and of itself isn't even a perfect calculus. What might take me an hour would probably take Angel 10 minutes, right? So it's really hard. And so it does take a lot of work and coordination. But what we have done is say, you know what, on, on vacations, there's going to be no homework. We're going to allow you some time to, to get caught up and, and on life and enjoy family. Now, sometimes they procrastinate a little bit. Maybe it was, you know, they was a long-term project. They end up doing it over break. But nevertheless, you know, that's the... Um, that's the idea. And also no assessment days when they return from vacation for the first few days. So they're not forced to study for a test over break and a time to kind of decompress and recharge. We also surveyed kids in 2016, 978 students participated. And you know, we knew students were stressed, but it was kind of startling to find out, you know, really to the extent of which they were. With 48% of the kids saying that their stress-related health or emotional problems caused, caused them to miss some school. 52% reported that stress-related health or emotional problems, problems on my head. <laughs> 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 
And, um, and then, and lastly, 37% of the students survey experienced exhaustion, headaches, and difficulty sleeping in the past month. And if you might imagine, here is a young man who <coughs> gets up very early to school. School starts at 8. They go to school at 2.41. They're all, for the most part, doing something after school. They're at sport, drama, art, or something like that. And so that takes you to 5. You go home. You hopefully have dinner with your parents. We'll see. I don't know if that happens with all of them, but hopefully they do. You know, you get showered, and now it's 7. And then you got, you know, 2 to 3 hours of homework a night. I mean, that's a long day, every day. So it really is a demanding schedule. 2016 and 17, we want focus on three priority areas. One is homework. And again, just that, that knowing that's really dynamic and difficult to gauge how much homework each kid is going to have a night, but really want to make sure that we are talking about it um, often. And then following up with the survey to make sure that we're living up to the expectations. Also having a discussion about extracurriculars, making sure the kids are doing things after school that they want to do, and not just to pad a resume, knowing, again, that the competition at the end of college is really challenging. Uh, and three, again, focusing on how can we engage kids, because if they're engaged and they're loving what they do, it doesn't feel uh, much like work. A couple of things we did that year was we had Denise Pope from Stanford University. Um, I talked about teaching for engagement, and she was really great. And another woman from uh, Stanford who addressed parents about raising an adult. Now, um, part of the issue we're dealing with is all kids trying to get in the best schools, and it begs the question, well, you have two people from Stanford talking, which is a, le which is a legitimate question. Um, however, you know, they, they started this program, and their message is outstanding. There's, they both have um, TED, TED Talks. I, I, would, I would welcome you to read their books or, or check out their TED Talks. In 17 and 18, we kind of ramped it up. We have a coach with Challenge Success, and we have a committee with, with including students that are on uh, the committee. You know, then we started to address some of the issues with athletics. And, and when I, issues, I say, we just want to make sure that the kids are not, you know, forced to practice four hours a day. Strict limits about when they can start, when it ends. And also some guidelines around, you know what, if the game is over, even if you took one bus to the away game and you have homework, you are allowed to leave and go home and do homework. Um, and so we also had a time management tool for kids. Sometimes they bite off a little more than they can chew and have them sit down and go through a day what it would look like when you consider homework and it will help them make sure that they're choosing and picking things um, that won't overburden them. Uh, we launched Q5 initiative which is great and also we're participating with seven other districts who are also um, involved with um, challenge success. So uh, this year one thing we're looking to do is a community read and uh, a book which is um, uh, uh, I can see there's a typo on there, but Angel did this slide, so that's okay. <laughs> uh, So where you go is not who you'll be, and again, not being defined by the college where you go, um, and where oftentimes um, there is some pressure socially. Kids don't even know how to act when, not only when they get rejected, but even when they get accepted. Sometimes now there's, well, my friends didn't get accepted yet. I am so... You know, it is this, this college process is a machine that we're caught up in and we're just trying to, to help kids manage it. We think about having an alumni panel back, including those kids that maybe didn't get into where they wanted to go, but you know what, things have worked out quite well. Um, and just continuing the dialogue and provide parent with resources, knowing this is a partnership. We can't do this alone. And I know parents are looking for some support as well. We did a shadow day with our leadership team where they, we followed a student all day just to get an idea of what it was like to be a student. Very interesting. I really enjoyed my, my time doing that. And we're looking to extend that to have other teachers, uh, other staff members do it. Um, and also, again, so it's the student well-being. We have a mindfulness initiative in the, in the district, and we're certainly part of that. And also focusing on gratitude, just being thankful for you know, the things we have, including this amazing building, amazing community that supports us, and a lot of caring adults in the building um, that, that care for us. That was, I think, 21 minutes. So, <laughs> without further ado, Mr. Cameron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In my defense, I think Angel took a couple minutes of that for the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can see we have to be on together. <laughs> um, Just in case you explain who you are. <laughs> yes, of course. My name is Justin Cameron. I'm the principal of Concord Middle School. Welcome to you all. I would like to extend an invite on um, any open times that we have available, art shows, um, we have a big musical at the middle school, any time that we have anything that promotes our students and our student learning, we'd love to see all of you there. So the first thing I want to share is just a quick slide of um, our work of Challenge Success as well. So the middle school is kind of chasing the greatness that is CCHS, um, and we're kind of all in this year with Challenge Success. 
Um, a couple of years ago, um, the middle school students were surveyed, but that data is now about two years old. So we kind of doubled down last year. Um, and this year, we attended the conference, as you can see, at Stanford University. Um, a part of my challenge success team at Concord Middle School includes students, as you see, uh, Boston families, Boston students, Concord students, Concord families, teachers, English teacher, math teacher. Um, most of you know Concord Middle School is two buildings, so we have both buildings represented with uh, students and teachers as well. So a lot of the things that you saw that the high school is engaged with, the middle school likewise is engaged with. Um, and we're really focused on student well-being. Um, and the research is quite clear that if there is something that is not well with the student in the social emotional realm, that's a blocker to the access to the curriculum. So if the student doesn't feel safe, especially at the middle school level, and um, you mentioned, or Mike mentioned, you know, the importance of, which is a good segue to our value for the home base, the importance of the relationship between the student and the adult. Um, the research is quite clear to at the middle school level that if the student sitting in front of the adult does not feel like the adult, um, you know, is really invested or even likes um, the student, then the student is not going to thrive. And that's our goal at Carpenter Middle School, is to make sure all students thrive emotionally and academically as well. So I'm going to show you um, just about three minutes of a video that captures the spirit of our advisory program, which is called Home Base. This really gives you a student center <laughs> feel. As Mike said, same thing at the middle school. Everything has a student present and has student energy as well. so that each kid would have a person, an adult in the building, that would be their adult to connect with and to engage with. The youth uh, behavioral risk survey and challenge success survey, some of that data really suggested um, that schools in the area uh, need programs that build and foster relationships between adults and students, but also work on uh, opportunities for students at this age to just have um, time to be kids and to have some fun. And then also to sort of get some of the curriculum out there around bullying, around just connecting, social, emotional, dealing with, um, you know, bringing down anxiety and just giving kids a place to vent, kind of, a home base. They seem excited about it. They actually request more time. So during the month of October, which is anti-bullying month, Students partake in bully-proofing challenges. Uh, all month long, during student lunches, students came down um, and took a seat in the ball pit and uh, made new friends, both at San Juan and Cuba. Well, the ball pit was an idea that came out of something we saw in Soul Pancake. And it was a way to get kids um, talking to each other, kids that don't normally talk <coughs> in the video on Soul Pancake. They invited strangers from the street, two strangers, to sit in the ball pit, and uh, much like we did here at the middle school, the two strangers sat in the ball pit and picked up a ball pit ball and asked a question of each other. To start the activity, the students watched the video and talked about the impact of, you know, taking a seat in a, in a ball pit with somebody you don't know. And things that maybe you wouldn't have known it otherwise. The ball pit project um, provides an opportunity for students to have fun, but also build connections with adults and other kids as well. So even eighth graders who are like, I know these kids so well, I've seen them forever. Um, they don't always know each other as well as they maybe think they do. They made assumptions about kids or they, they form their peer groups, but this gets to tear down some of those walls. Um, and I think it's been really impactful. I think it's been fun for the kids, and I think it forces them to put themselves out there in a really safe environment. So, well, hi, stranger. Hello, what's your name? Adelise. Give each other a well wish and smile. Here you are. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Okay. What's your favorite color and why? Really, really light purple. I don't know why I like that color. I just kind of know about that. <laughs> okay. I like red. It's the first color in 
her ankle. What's your worst injury? I slightly spray, um, sprained my ankle before. Right? Vanilla and chocolate cupcakes. Vanilla. I like chocolate. What's your favorite animal? Uh, unicorn. <laughs> I love you, <laughs> <laughs> What would you do? I'll take pictures. Do you care about popularity? A little bit. I just care about how I like look in the morning. What is the most daring thing you've ever done? When I sold an organ, mm -hmm. I jumped off like this huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, Seattle. <laughs> I went to England and I've been to Asia. Who is your favorite cartoon character? I'd say Ben and Jerry are my favorite cartoon characters. <laughs> what scares you? Um, I hate swimming with fish. It freaks me out. I like to terrorize horses and I like to hang out with my friends. Playing video games and playing with my cat. I do you like cats. Who is your favorite superhero? Wonder Woman? <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite food? Artichokes. I don't know why. Yes, I do like Boston. Boston is very yummy. I really don't like fruit pie. Like apple pie. Oh, uh, probably ice cream. What makes you proud? I like seeing my friends succeed. Like, you know you know how those people are like, oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. she got his 10. I'm so jealous. I'm like, I'm proud of them. Um, if you're an animal, what would you be? So that gets you a sense of one of the activities that evolved in my office for a whole month. Um, pretty much enveloped in my office, um, which is, you know, if you think about it, a great justification of, you know, what a principal's office is supposed to be. You know, walk in and think I'm in trouble and see this giant ball pit. Um, but as you can see, you know, what the camera did there was, you know, I think did what or does what a lot of people do when they're holding a camera: try to fade in the background and allow kids. You know, what you saw was, you know, when we at the school, at, at the middle school, when we interact with the students, we forget sometimes that they're children. Um, and some of the answers, you know, they're starting like they're going to be so, like, deep. And they, you know, so what is the scariest moment of your life? You know, jumping off a jungle gym. Uh, um, it reminds you that they're children, which is, you know, so important for all of us in this work that we're doing. And I think that's what the middle school is doing right now. We're kind of, you know, re-imaging ourselves to make sure that we capture that childhood um, and we make sure that the middle school extends childhood because that's what's being lost in our society as well, you know, in my opinion, is that the kids are just growing up too fast. Um, and often when I was a child and I was doing things that were juvenile, you know, I was told to grow up. And I don't hear that very much too often those words grow up because I honestly believe, we believe at the middle school that children are just growing up too fast. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to recapture it and home base is one device. Last quick side, slide I just have is just how much data should be our portal into those students. Um, so we very much know that all students need an opportunity to be children as I just said um, and have a place to have some fun, to focus on <coughs> bullying-proof interventions, a bullying-proof <laughs> curriculum, academic advisement, that's what home base offers our students. But we also have what's called an RTI. RTI stands for Response to Intervention. And we, um, just yesterday, this is actually a picture of yesterday, where my RTI team um, at the middle school was a part of a social and emotional screener uh, training. Um, and we're going to be screening all students um, in something called PAIR, which is about a 20-minute screener that will give us data to those students who are really um, might be struggling social and emotionally, the ones that we're afraid that we just don't know. As I'm kind of packing up my lunch uh, when Tuesday night to prepare for coming back from the winter break, it kind of hit me, you know, like, I wondered at that moment, um, and kind of fear enveloped me of the students that I don't know of that were really struggling that night to come back to school. Um, and it's with the data and the screeners that I believe is kind of a, a net to throw over all the students. Um, because the questions that are asked in these screeners are so benign um, that it feeds us, the data support team, and then you know, we'll turn around and share that with parents when there are questions <coughs> and data that suggests that there might be supports that are needed. Tier one are all the students, 
Um, and basically, home base is a good example um, of a tier one intervention. All students get it. Tier two are the students that after the screener is done, after all students complete the screener, we might get some students. Tier two is usually about 40% of the population where you know they just might be struggling, but it might be age appropriate but it reminds us uh, we need to have these supports in the classroom. And tier three should only be about three to 5% of the population. Those are the kids that um, are screened in through a youth behavioral risk survey or SOS, which we have in the high school, uh, at the eighth grade, where the students might need a pretty um, you know, high level intervention that might be sub-separate. So that's some student wellness that's happening at the middle school. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Matt Lucy. I'm the principal of the Willard School, and it's great to see some familiar faces um, here today. Uh, it's my second year, and um, but there are a few things that uh, are have been universal in my experience, and one is that a student who is uh, engaged, who is comfortable, who feels cared for as a student that uh, learns best. Um, years ago, I read a, uh, some research that looked at three primary variables in a student's happiness and readiness to learn, and that was um, reflectiveness, optimism, and gratefulness. And to be prepared to do that type of reflection, there needs to be a time when we provide ourselves the license to stop to be mindful, to exclude a very busy world. And you've heard from the middle school principals, the high school principal, it goes down to our elementary age students that there is a great deal of tumult in life these days, much more so than we had as when we were children, 100 years, 200 years ago. If you think about uh, uh, my, uh, my grandfather said, Matthew, I lived in a great time. I saw the electric light bulb, flight, we went to the moon, we integrated the internet into our lives. Think about his childhood, where he lived on a street, before lights, he had his neighbors, he had an extended family. The greatest variable in his day might be, right, whether it's going to rain or not. <laughs> Now today, we have a place where there is a great deal of challenge for all our kids, and also we as an adult. So what I'm suggesting to you is mindfulness. When we give ourselves the license to stop, to reflect, we're in a better place to do our best teaching and our students to do their best learning. So today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how our mindfulness not only allows us to do our best learning, but also how we want to leverage some of these higher, higher order um, competencies that we want our students to be able to embrace and to grow and ultimately to leave the high school with. And we're gonna hear a little bit more of these when Sherry comes up, but to be self-aware, to be able to manage themselves, to have social awareness of how they interact with others, the relationship skills that are expected and then how to be a responsible citizen, it starts with our ability to slow down. Um, it's, mindfulness is part of our social emotional curriculum, but it's also very separate. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about a few things that we do and uh, how mindfulness is engaged regularly in our classrooms, in the elementaries, in the middle school, and in the high school. So first I'd like to um, ask you to um, try something out with me. <laughs> and this is something that would happen every day in most classrooms. Um, there may be a time in which in the day that the classroom teacher will say, My friends, we're going we're gonna to try something new today. We're going to learn something new. We're going to be exploring something new. And to prepare ourselves, I want you to be aware of your breathing. So I'd ask you now, Place a hand on your, on your stomach and one on your chest. And if you're comfortable, and this is always part of what we do, is to the readiness that children take risks. In silence, listen to your own breathing. 
three of them for three seconds. Breathe out. Breathe in for three seconds. Breathe out. Find a place of comfort. Consider one thing that has happened well in the past 24 hours. Thank you. With that, we have our students grounding themselves, being reflective of themselves within the community, being optimistic about what they're going to learn next. But we have to give ourselves license to do that. We as adults, our classroom teachers, need to provide license to do that. If we do so, then our students will have entry points to do this type of work, our social emotional learning work, as well as our academic work. It's a high priority for the Concord Public Schools that we provide space for students to be students, to feel cared for, to have the ability to reflect be grateful and optimistic to do their best work. It's not only the quiet times where we use multi-sensory. It might be a time in which we invite students to go outside, to listen to nature, to feel the sun on their face, to ground themselves. Research also suggests, uh, there's a great book uh, entitled Spark a few years ago, Get the Body Moving. So in the mornings, in many of our schools, there's an opportunity for kids to get in early, to move around. The synapses are popping, right? That's great. The adrenaline is flowing, and kids engage. We, as human beings, are active creatures. There's only now, post-industrial age, that we're asking kids to sit in chairs all day for hours and hours. That's not what we did. That's why in a classroom, We'll have times in which we are engaging in yoga. We're crossing the midline. We're getting up for movement breaks. All the research suggests that's what we need to do. But beyond the research, we know in our hearts it's good for kids. And it's good for we adults. Regularly when with the, the doctor in our weekly meetings, every, every two hours on Tuesday morning, think of us. We're with Dr. Hunter, right? <laughs> Pray for us. Right? <laughs> Halfway through, Lori will read the room and say, I think it's time to get up and move around. And we do. Right? It's good for kids, good for us. So, breathing, active movement, sound, um, imagery. We're going to engage now in a unit and we're going to explore <coughs> the oceans. And again, I would invite the kids in my classroom, my friends, if you're comfortable, close your eyes and think about sitting on the beach, the sounds that you hear, the texture of the sand, the smell of the brine. And then we would discuss what is a littoral perm? How is it that tidal pools create a biosphere that enables different types of uh, organisms to thrive? Right? It's that type of emotional engagement. It's not about the content. Content's one piece of it. It's about content and lifelong learning, about being present and having a healthy life. That's what we do, and that's what one of our priorities. Um, and in each building, we have our mindfulness committees um, that know the particular needs of a building. But likewise, those mindfulness committees gather together, share best practices, review research, and then discuss uh, different initiatives that might be district-wide. Um, our HR department regularly sends out information for our staff to be mindful of, to reinforce. Right? We need to look after ourselves as adults so we can look after our students the best. So know that we care for the children every single day, that we have adjusted to the needs and the pressures of modernity, 
and we're doing so in a very concrete, mindful manner. Thank you. Gary, you're up. Glad that I was able to do those deep breaths before I get started. <laughs> so um, I'm Sherry Foy, I'm the school counselor at Alcott, and I'm here to talk about Open Circle. Um, Open Circle is an ev evidence-based social and emotional learning program, and um, it's included on several national lists. I could go over the whole list, but I will not. Um, I'll simply say that um, it's included on Castle's Guide to Effective Social Emotional Learning Program and also the U.S. Department of Education's Guidebook for Exemplary and Promising <coughs> Safe, Disciplined, and Drug-Free Schools. Um, so it, it is um, very well known um, and very well recognized. Um, it's a program that's offered in kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, it also uses a whole school approach. And essentially what that means is everyone in the school um, is utilizing the language in, in Open Circle and is using Open Circle uh, material. So um, teachers, administrators, uh, counselors like myself, support staff, custodians, um, librarians, um, families as well. Parents and families are included in this program too, and I, I'll go over um, that a little bit later on. Um, so they really take a whole school approach, or even a whole community approach, maybe a better way of, of um, describing it, to learn, model, and reinforce the pro-social skills um, throughout the, the school day and also throughout students' day at home. The goals of the program um, are to proactively develop children's skills for recognizing and managing emotions, um, to help them develop empathy, uh, to build positive relationships, and um, clearly to develop problem-solving skills as well. And secondly, it's to develop a community where students feel safe, they feel cared for, um, and students are engaged in learning. Without that community atmosphere, it can be difficult to develop the skills that I talked about previously. Um, so Open Circle, the way it's implemented, um, it is um, done using a grade differentiated curriculum. So at each grade level, um, it follows the same um, curriculum so to speak, however, it's modified based on the grade level that is being taught. Um, the material and concepts that are in the fifth grade manual are different from what's being taught at kindergarten. You know, clearly the younger the age, uh, the more watered down the curriculum is. But it's the same language and the same concepts throughout, so that way kids have a number of years to learn and really incorporate the skills. Um, their research, in fact, showed that it takes um, two to three years for the skills to actually be generalized and used. So the more that it is um, modeled and reinforced over time, the better kids are able to actually utilize the material that's in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's implemented by classroom teachers, um, and it's done so twice a week, ideally, uh, for 15 minutes each time. It is recommended that you keep it to that 15 minutes because you want kids always wanting more. So if you keep it short, then they feel like, oh, wait a second, I'm already done. Um, there are 32 lessons in each curriculum, and um, it is uh, uh, broken down into five units. The units for um, the curriculum um, are beginning together, managing ourselves, strengthening your relationships, how to sort problems, and problem solving. It's in an open circle format, and that format um, is literally a circle that has an opening. What that means is that um, there's a space that's available for a chair, for a person, um, or in theory for any additional opinion or voice that needs to be heard. Um, the piece where families come in is there's a newsletter, um, 18 in fact, home link family newsletters, that coincide with the lessons that are being taught so that families can stay um, abreast of what's being talked about in the open circle lessons. So that way they can model and reinforce those same concepts in that same language at home. Um, open circle is um, known for promoting the use of common vocabulary um, and behavioral expectations. So just to give one example of the common vocabulary that's used, um, if you were to go in any one of the elementary schools and say to a classroom, okay, show me your school listening look. Every student would know exactly what you mean. Um, and so that's helpful because then students know, okay, 
Um, the adult is expecting me to sit up um, to make sure that I'm looking at the speaker, to keep my body <coughs> still, and to make sure that my brain is focused on the person who is speaking. So that common language allows me to say those you know, four or five steps in just one phrase, school listening look. Um, it's known for, uh, as well for improving the school safety, climate, um, and student engagement as well. Um, it increases pro-social and critical thinking skills and also uh, reduces negative behaviors. It's known for improving um, educator skills in classroom management in dialogue facilitation um, and in their ability to address students' social emotional learning needs um, and strengthens educators' social emotional learning skills, um, their trust, and their collaboration as well. And finally, it actually buys back time for academics because um, you're proactively addressing behaviors. So if you don't have to deal with or address all of those behaviors um, later on in the year because students have learned all of these skills and you're actually saving yourself time, which means you can focus more on academics. So I think I'm within my time limit. So I was hoping I could take one minute to do a quick open circle activity. Um, and we would probably call this an open circle game. So if you could indulge me, um, and if there's anyone that um, is not able to participate, that's perfectly OK, too. But this is called a stand-up sit-down game. Um, so you're simply going to follow the direction. If the statement applies to you, please stand up, OK? So stand up if you are the youngest child in your family. And sit down. Stand up if you're the oldest. And sit down. Stand up if you're an only. An only child. Oh. Ah. Stand up if you prefer cheese pizza. Sit down. If you prefer pepperoni. Sit down. And if you're a veggie lover, stand up. Wow. Stand up if you grew up in Concord. Stand up if you grew up in the Northeast. And sit down. Any other part of the United States? Sit down. In another country? And sit down. If you play an instrument? Sit down. If you speak any other languages? And sit down. This might be controversial. If you're a Yankees fan. <laughs> if you're a Red Sox fan. <laughs> and stand up if you prefer another sport besides, another sport or hobby besides baseball. And sit down. So the goals of this simple quick game um, really are to learn more about each other, um, to learn what we have in common with individuals, and to learn what we have in common um, collectively as a whole as well, um, as well as just understand um, and appreciate and recognize individual differences. So that would be an example of one activity that's done in Open Circle. Okay. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Namichi, and I am the director of METSCO, and uh, this is my first year in the district. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our METCO program. Uh, just to give you sort of a brief background about myself, I was born and raised in Ghana. I came to the United States when I was um, about 10 years old. And when we first arrived here, my family uh, lived in Seattle, Washington, and then traveled to Maryland and finally settled in Massachusetts. Uh, growing up, education was very, very important to my family. My father was a professor uh, in the School of Engineering, and uh, my mother was a caterer. And so, you know, when we came to the U.S., one of the challenges, uh, obviously, was, you know, it was a huge social um, and culture shock for me. But, you know, at the back of our minds, my father always sort of said to us, education was the key to the Broadway. And, and that's something that um, I always try to sort of instill in, in our students. And, our, and, and, and obviously, specifically, our Boston Metro students that really, if, if they take uh, this opportunity seriously, they can really go anywhere in life. 
And so, to give you a little brief history about how MECO uh, came about. So in the 1950s, African American families petitioned for integration uh, based on the decision uh, that happened with the Brown versus Board of Education, which the decision was made in 1964. By 1966, um, that decision had reached Boston and MECO was formed. Really with two objectives. Uh, was first to break down barriers to equitable educational opportunities, and secondly, to create rich, racially diverse learning environments for students of all backgrounds. MECO today, there are over 37, and I think it's actually 38, uh, MECO uh, receiving districts. From South Shore, you have Hangham, Cohasset, Situate, Braintree, and then you move up to the Middlesex County, you have Natick, Newton, uh, Framingham. They used to have a MECO program, but due to their growing diversity, they no longer have a MECO program. MECO exists all the way out in Springfield, Massachusetts, and then here uh, in Sudbury, in Lincoln, in Concord, um, and then all the way up to the North Shore, Swampscott, Melrose, uh, Linfield, uh, just to name a few. MECO today here in Concord, uh, we've had a very strong partnership for 51 years. So that's, that's huge. That's, that's, a, that's a big um, accomplishment for us. Um, and our enrollment continues to grow. Um, currently, we have about 83 Boston MECO students on the Concord side and 53 Boston MECO students in the Concord Carlisle uh, High School. Uh, the breakdown, as you can see there on the, on the right-hand side, uh, we have about 47 Boston Medical students at Alcott. As I mentioned before, 53 uh, Boston Medical students at the high school, 36 at the middle school, and that completes it. A few years ago, we had um, medical students also at Willard and Thoreau, but due to um, uh, provided more of a cohesion for Boston <laughs> Medical students. Uh, the structure of MECO was reconfigured, so they're, so the students are more um, represented in those three um, schools currently. Um, now, <coughs> you know, the cohort model it actually does, you know, does benefit our MECO students because if you think about it, if you are the only person of color in a classroom, there are many challenges that come with that. And I personally have experienced that my whole life. Um, and so I can, you know, I can speak more into that, but on a one-on-one -on -one basis, feel free. And I'll be more than happy to share. Um, but I think the current model that we have does, um, does benefit our students. And, and I personally see the results of that uh, from an academic standpoint and obviously from a social emotional standpoint as well. And just a cool sort of fun fact about MECO. So, Originally, MECO was comprised of largely African-American families. Today, and this is a small sample of about 70 students in the Concord and Concord Carlisle um, uh, MECO program. As you can see, very well represented. Um, you have folks from South America. Uh, you have obviously a huge population still of African-Americans. You have uh, folks from Honduras. Um, Cape Verde, um, Barbados, Ethiopian, Nigerian. Um, you have some who identify as French, British, German, Native American, and so forth. So Meco, the you know the demographics of Meco has completely shifted, and it and it's you know as you can see from a global uh, perspective, that's where our society is moving towards a more diverse uh, society. And MECO is just one of those um, programs now that is actually it's the only program in the whole nation uh, that is focused on uh, desegregation or integrating students uh, into um, largely predominantly white uh, communities. Um, and so this is just a great, great, great uh, opportunity for towns like Concord to really embrace and increase the diversity. So that's also a great segue to me. my dear friend, <laughs> Principal Walcott, Sharon Young. Thank you. <laughs> I've been here.
here uh, the longest, so I sometimes refer to myself as the old lady um, of the administrative team, 16 years. Um, and I've seen a number of changes in Concord over those 16 years. And one of the major changes has been an increase in diversity. If you look at, um, and that's a change nationally, if you look at what we have, how we have changed, um, when I first started 16 years ago, we had very few students who spoke a second language, and we had a part-time uh, teacher, um, English teaching teacher, who actually would come and spend, you know, two half days a week. We now have a full-time teacher, and then some, and there's a teacher who teaches English in all of our elementary schools, and middle and high. Um, because our population is changing. If you look to our um, home language survey, we have 141, this is just Alcott, 141 uh, students use another language at home. Wow. Yeah, 30% of our population. Those are the changes that we're starting to see and those are the changes that we as a, as a school system have to respond to. Um, of those 141 students, 55 <coughs> use their home language more than English. So they're going home, they're coming into school, we're teaching English, we're doing all of our instruction in English, they might be getting support around that, and then they'll go home and they'll switch back into their home language. We have about 30 different languages um, currently, as of today. If you see me, maybe in a month it might change a little, but right now we're at 30 different languages. And we think we represent about 25 different countries. Um, one of the things that we, um, that we did is the PE teacher, and that's kind of like a stretched out thing, but if you can see it up below, he put up all the flags that represented those 25 countries, and as students came through PE, they would say, oh wait, my flag's not up there. Oh wait, my family's flag's not up there. So now we have 75 flags representing different countries um, that students feel that they, their family comes from, their grandparents came from, their parents came from, and that's on, and so they see a piece of themselves represented in the school. And that's something that we have really um, focused on um, in the last five to six years, five to eight years, has been really making sure our students see themselves represented on our walls, represented in the holidays they may celebrate. Because <coughs> if you see yourself represented or you see others that look like you or celebrate things like you, you feel like you're part of the community and you're more accepted. So from that, from the changes that have occurred in the district as a whole, we've started a district-wide cultural competency committee. Um, we are focused on some key areas, hiring teachers of color. If you have students of color in the school, we want to make sure they see adults in the building that represent who they are. And CMS has started an allies group, which basically <coughs> supports teachers of color and the allies um, that want to support them at their um, at their school, and they meet weekly, monthly, once a month, month to month. Um, so we're we're in the process. We uh, last year went to a uh, hiring um, job fair, job fair, and um, to recruit because that's the goal here is to try and have our teaching population be as diverse as our student population. We also have professional development district wide. So we started the year with Beverly Daniel Tatum, and she talked to us about um, race, culture, helping our students, and helping staff develop a toolkit to help our students. We have two more uh, professional development opportunities coming up this year, and they, they will have the same focus and the same, um, providing us with the same strategies for helping our students. We also have some school-based professional development or student support. So you might see at CCHS, there's an intersection club. You might see at CMS, a RISE club, supporting students. Elementary level, you might, we are doing really our focus on our work has really been around educating and expanding the skills of our staff. Um, and then some identity work, teaching the teachers to recognize that their identity may not be the same as someone else's identity. Everyone has their own identity and we have to recognize that, teach to that, understand that. And I finished in less than my time. Wow.
Your information was critical. Your timing was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Angel Charles. I'm the principal of Thoreau Elementary School. This is my fourth year in Concord, um, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to raise awareness and inform all of you about two new district-wide special education programs that we are housing at Thoreau right around the corner. So last year, we partnered with WestEd to do a review of our special education programs K-8. And one of the biggest takeaways that we got from that report was that we needed to offer more of a range of programs for students um, with special education needs in the district so that it wasn't just you were either in a general education classroom or you were outplaced into an out of district placement. So we happened to be in a perfect situation where we had a cohort of students who were, current, who were in the integrated preschool who were already scheduled to come to Thoreau, so we figured we would capitalize on that opportunity of having a cohort to create a program. So I'm going to talk about that program, which is called the Intensive Learning Program, and then I'm going to talk about a brand new program that's about two months old, um, which is a social-emotional learning focus program that we are also housing at Thoreau. So first, um, the intensive learning program is a self-contained classroom. There are currently seven students in the classroom, mm -hmm. and we are servicing students who are within the K-2 to two age band. Obviously, that will change as the students grow, and we will adjust as, as they age out of the program and their needs change. So the students in this program receive the full range of special education services. They receive occupational therapy, speech and language. They may have a behavior analysis program. It could be any, any need, we can meet it. We currently have seven students in the program and the programs are highly individualized. So what a day in the life of one student looks like in the classroom may be completely different from the day of another student within that program. We have a low student to adult ratio in this program and it is led by a teacher who has a severe disability licensure and a background as a BCBA, which is a board certified behavior analyst. Um, going into this classroom is a highlight of every single day. I stop in every day, um, the kids are thriving and I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity to house the program in our building. Brand new, social emotional learning focus program. This program is designed for um, a Oftentimes, I would say districts struggle the most to provide programming for these students because they also tend to be highly individualized programs. It's a therapeutic program for students who have social, emotional, behavioral, or mental health challenges. Um, and the components of the day is not just strictly academic. So they may have a portion of the day where they do individual therapy, where they participate in group therapy, where parents come in for a therapy group, and where they're also getting academics. So these are not students whose primary disability is related to academics or learning needs. These tend to be more things that you can't see, so to speak. Um, our students who are in this program are also simultaneously <coughs> accessing the grade level standards at or above. So just because a student's in the program, they could be operating two full grade levels in advance or behind but they are given the opportunity to work at their level. We only have two students in the program now, and I think part of that is because maybe you haven't heard of it. So we are trying to talk it up, get the word out there, so please spread the word to your various groups. We have these great programs at Thoreau. And again, just because it's a self-contained classroom does not mean that the students are not given the opportunity to be included, but it is on a highly individualized day and can vary from minute to minute and day to day. So we're very flexible. This program is staffed by a teacher who has a moderate disabilities license and is a school psychologist. Um, there is also an, a therapeutic assistant in the classroom to support the day. So spread the word. We are thrilled to have these programs. We hope that we will be able to meet more students' needs within our district and be sending less kids out and keeping kids in their community where we feel they belong to the extent that they can be with us. Thank you. Um, we can readily see from these presentations what a rich kind of curricular world our, our children are, are growing up. 
I, when I think of my own elementary schools, and then I think of what you all are doing, I mean, the, 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 the difference is breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. Um, I, I would like to ask a, a general question uh, on behalf of the league, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. How do you, in, in these, first of all, I just want us to notice around us how serendipitous that the, the pictures in this room right now are of children playing in all sorts of different venues and ways. I mean, it just, as, as each of you was talking, and then I would spot a picture, and I would just think, oh, it, they were just joyfully uh, collaborative with what you all were saying and what you were doing. So uh, sometimes life just works that way, doesn't it? Um, given, the, given the invisibility to some degree of um, success, or measuring the success of these programs, uh, how, do you, how have you talked together and worked together to try to find a way to um, d determine how successful, how, um, how forward-moving these programs have been? In other words, what are you using to, um, to determine um, for yourselves uh, the success that you've achieved so far and what kind of goals you have in the future? It's a big question, but, and I don't know which one of you, many of you would like to take that on. I'd lo we'd love to hear from you. And don't all <laughs> no, it's it killed me to sit here and talk <laughs> right. I tell you. <laughs> well, Laurie, why don't you take this sure, on? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, that's an ongoing conversation right now, especially where these aren't academically based program. We're really relying on survey data from the kids. Um, some of it's the really formal, structured surveys we've used in the past. The Youth Risk Behavior Survey is the institutionalized one. We just did that this past spring at the middle and high schools. The new data is fresh out and available to us, um, so we're analyzing that. Some of these programs are in their, are well, well established, but still in their infancy in terms of impact, so we're gonna need the longitudinal data to see it. Um, and then we do a lot of informal work with kids to get that anecdotal feedback to exit tickets and other ways we ask them to give us, give us ways. And of course, then there's the anecdotal day-to-day -day world that we live of the more time we spend on the structured programs, the more time we're spending on academics because our kids are in a better place to access those. Um, so that's an ongoing discussion. It is going to piggyback into the academic data, and I want to just, the part I, I would like to make sure we frame here is that um, none of this is exclusionary to the academic rigor and richness that we are so proud of and um, are looking to maintain. It's meant to complement and enhance that. Um, the strategic planning work we did last year really solidify that this community's um, <coughs> perspective on what the schools should and needed to be offering to kids was to maintain that. And that was so well established and really the feedback we got from multiple stakeholder groups across all different forums in, in the community was that that was in place. The parts that popped were the stuff we're talking about mm -hmm. today. That this was what the areas of need and focus had to be. So if you look at the strategic plan on the webpage, you'll see all of these are the are the objectives that we set, and this is the work in action um, as established last year. A lot of it was already seeded, which I think also validated that things that were moving were going in the direction that they needed to. Um, and so this is three to five years worth of work. So we're looking down at really early early stages of success, but it's going to be that longitudinal. You know, the part I'm going to be eager to see is the kids getting mindfulness at elementary school. What do their stress numbers look like when they get to the high school? Um, that's, I think, where we're really going to be excited to see, hopefully, progress and, and positive outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we would take questions from people in the audience. Do you want to start us off? Thank you. Angel, I have both of you discussed really the the schools putting them in place. The question I have is, um, you know, I recall when I was in school and there was a special class and you know, those kids were isolated, they were made fun of, so there wasn't acceptance by the other students uh, of them. Um, and I was wondering how you're approaching that side of the equation of ensuring that when they are included, that they are welcomed and the, the elementary students also are expanding their view of the world of, of people and abilities. So could, you, could you all hear the question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've had to do a lot of um, work with our students around um, what does it mean to be different? What does it mean to be an inclusive school community? And we have not shied away from conversations around, um, for example, if there is a student who, you know, who has a physical 
you break a leg, you have a cast. That's pretty obvious and you know what, but we do have students who exhibit some unexpected behaviors at times or, or movements of their bodies. So we don't ignore those. We actually say, this is, when that child says, how come he, she's flapping her arms like that? We have a conversation about why. Um, and we have a conversation about how that's okay. That's just, that's just the way. We don't pretend like it's not happening. We also try to be very mindful of providing inclusion opportunities during critical times. So instead of just having a child be included or around their regular education peers at lunch and at recess, we try to look for more opportunities such as specials or whatever subject area because every child's different. So if I have, um, if I have a challenge that doesn't to, to the same extent as others impact certain subject areas, then if I can participate in math and be included, but reading is not really a good fit, then I should be included during math time with support. Mm -hmm. So I would say providing meet meaningful opportunities for inclusion and making sure that we have the adult support to facilitate <laughs> students when they're ready and to the extent that they need support when they're doing it. We're not just dumping them or you know being not mindful about it. Casey. Uh, this is part comment, but sort of also a question. As a parent of an avowed hand flapper who's in kindergarten, <laughs> uh, who's on an IEP, who um, attended the lovely integrated preschool, which is part of the um, uh, Concord Public School District as well, where they have their community peers involved with kids on IEP, so they're learning from a very young age how to appreciate one another's differences. I think the work that you've done in such a short time is really incredible, mm -hmm. and how it's done at the pre-K level all the way mm -hmm. through 22, really, mm -hmm. which is how long a student can stay. <coughs> and it's a testament to the you know, educational leadership from the principals, the counselors, the individual educators, and from the front office, from Lori. And I think that, that really is so um, heartening as a parent. In my child, I didn't know a year ago if you'd be able to stay in district but through the work of the educators that um, he's been with at the Integrated Preschool and now at Willard, thank you, Mr. Lucy, um, he, he can. And I think if you take a look at what, what's gone on at Thoreau, what Angel is doing, that is really no small task. That is so huge. When it comes to special education, each kid is so different. And when you're looking at the cohort that is in the intensive learning program, you have kids who may not be verbal, you may have kids who are running at a cognitive level much below the age that they are. And the fact that they're able to accommodate them, help them access the curriculum, and bring them back into their community is unbelievable. But it also pays dividends going forward in terms of how much, as a community, we save going forward on costs for schools. And it makes, it's sort of one of those things where not only does it make you feel warm and fuzzy inside, makes you feel good from an economic standpoint. <laughs> and and I, I really do urge people who, you know, as you go to town meeting and you think about these things, this is the kind of forward thinking because they don't pay immediate dividends. As Laura was saying, you're looking to see the social emotional pieces down the road when they're five years out. That's not something that hits the budget immediately. So this investment, this top heavy investment going all the way through the system is so critical from both you know, having our children succeed, but also having a town be able to sustain this level mm -hmm. of educational you know, excellence, excellence and inclusion. So I think you know, as we go into town meeting season and gear up for it, thinking that through and, and having that percolate down, because it really does make a huge difference, because many of these students will come back and be part of our community. Mm -hmm. And the investment they get early on makes such a huge difference. So I would say um, my only question is, as parents and as community members, what can we do to echo this out further? What can we do to be supportive, and how can we be helpful? Thank you. Um, do you want to respond to that? Or you want to yeah. 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 We didn't even ask you. Yeah. <laughs> really appreciate it. The benefit of being true. Yeah, well, I appreciate that greatly. You know, the work that we've been doing, Angel mentioned the K-8 special ed review, where we really brought in some outside eyes to look at what was happening. That actually dovetailed following a high school review that happened first last fall. 
Um, we're about to do the preschool this, this, this winter, so we're really trying to get that comprehensive view. And, and one of the themes was you've got cohorts of kids who could be staying if you're willing to commit to the cost, energy, and time uh, to, to building some pr intensive programs in districts. So, you know, Angel's, Angel's the one to speak this, out this morning. Justin's building um, middle school programs um, a little more slowly. We started a social-emotional program there this fall. I mean, the way we're doing this now, because we're so into the early planning stages, literally some of how we've done this is a little, you know, the plane is flying in the air, and as kids' needs really bubble to a level of, boy, how are we going to do this, when I get a call about, I don't know if I can maintain this child, instead of saying, go look at out-of-district placements, I'm saying hire a teacher. So that's, that's where we're at the moment. The goal is a long-term plan that's a little more comprehensive and slowed down a little bit, so we built the... Obviously, everybody needs a vertical continuum, right? So the kids that we're keeping um, in angel school in the really young grades, we need to be sure they've got places to go. My fav one of my favorite moments this fall was being in a music class with that crew um, <laughs> and then watching them engage and participate with their peers. So a lot, a lot of good, good work there. So it, it's about you know being patient with us where there's time needed. And I think that's some of the work we're going to be doing with families, um, that the energy is so positive. It is going to take time to get the comprehensive view, so um, it's about individual conversations while we build a, a structure. Um, so there's a lot of positivity here, and we're excited for that, and we hope that'll continue and just keep sharing out what we're working on. We are really deep in the throes of still looking through those reviews and responding to them. Um, the high school revamped all of its more t typical regular <coughs> educational services. This isn't just the intensive work we're doing. So they re reworked their entire programmatic um, structure for the more traditional special ed services that are ac more academically based or in less intense need for some of the social emotional and um, what I thought was going to be a year and a half's worth of work because the staff and I have to, I'm going to stress the point of like this is this is bottom up all of this um, they took the review they received a year ago and what I thought was going to be implementation for fall of 19 was ready to roll fall of 18 because of their level of engagement and motivation. And we're already seeing ourselves do better by the kids. Um, none of this is all of us though, right? So that's the other side of the work that we're empowering teachers and building ideas from them. And the work, the work that matters most is theirs. Yes, the vision is ours in a shared way, but the, the execution of it all is critical that they're part of that conversation. So. Um, we mentioned student voice earlier. We've been really working hard on teacher voice as well. And family voice. And I guess that's probably the part I'll just answer Casey's question with. Community and family voice is really, really important to us. So that feedback is, is an ongoing hope and expectation. So. Are you going to put us in the ball pit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> you know, and I just I want to bring that back. I want to point out that Casey and other members of the league have been powerful in helping the league to understand. Uh, the head of our education committee for years, Julie Rowan. I mean, they've just helped us to understand the importance of this integration and this work, and, and allowed us to think, uh, to realize how important it is to present this kind of program. Um, and so we're, we're deeply grateful for, that, for those insights, for that leadership, for that thoughtfulness. It's made a huge difference. Uh, both to us as a league and, and what, what we can help to emphasize in the community. I see some wonderful more questions. Carlin first and then second. Switching to the middle school. Recently the town approved the uh, creation of a public uh, a, a resource service officer. How has that been integrated into your system? How is that working? Sure. Everybody understand the question or understand the reason it's posed? You yep. want to re restate the course, Justin? Sure. Okay. So, I, actually, can you say it? We, uh, the public resource officer that yeah. was uh, uh, created the position for the middle school um, to help with the students. How is that working out, and what's the role of that function in connection with wellness and other issues that you're facing? Yep. Um, thank you for asking that question. So, um, in speaking with the chief, you know, one of the earlier conversations I had when I came into the district about a year ago is community policing is a big part of, you know, their mission uh, at Concord Police. And um, the role of the school resource officer is just housed on both campuses, the PB campus and the Sandmore campus, has granted him, Kevin, um, a chance to be um, just accessible and visible 
um, in the student's school day, which is very different from um, Officer Scott, if you know Officer Scott, and just how stretched thinly he was. Um, Officer Scott was probably in a place, um, and if he was standing here with me, he would share this, where he was only accessible and available at the middle school if we had a crisis. Um, and whereas there's a proactive measure that is brought um, to a police officer who is engaged in our PE classes, our student lunches, um, reading with the students um, in the library, but also interacting um, with our students um, when there's a low level problem. Um, you know, students are already accessing him um, as an adult that they trust. Um, you know, when there is a you know a problem in a middle school you know middle school student's mind that might not even be close to a crisis. Um, so he has given us <coughs> access to another adult. Uh, he's actually a, um, an adult of color as well. So my Boston uh, students and the students of Concord who are of color have identified uh, very quickly with him um, as a person that they can trust and go to. Um, so having someone available to us um, almost every day um, has just been a game changer for middle school. And, and Justin, could you explain, he's wearing a uniform, right? Mm -hmm. He is wearing a uniform. And that, that taught me something. Can you explain why? Sure. Why he's wearing why a uniform. Why he wears a uniform. Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, I think one of the things that changed um, after the school shootings started <coughs> in, in right, right around 1999 and September 11th, and really the culture that we're in, is, you know, when I got into administration, um, you know, we used to do a lot that celebrated our community. We used to do a lot with senior citizens. We used to do a lot with fire, uh, first responders, police. Um, I found, um, you know, right after probably New York and Sandy Hook, that the times that we bring um, police first responders into the school, and I would not provide notification to my families, um, you know, social media would come alarmed, um, and the school secretary, you know, phone would be ringing up. <laughs> um, so we've really found, unfortunately, in speaking with the chief, there's been a shift, you know, of, um, you know, uh, uh, conquered police officers in uniform on campus, um, and some community members and some parents are alarmed at that. Um, so we're really trying to break that down um, and really share that. You know, when there are police on campus, when there are fire on campus, you know, they might be there for a lunch, they might be there for a breakfast, they might be there for an art show. Um, I still provide the notification, of course, especially when we're doing something. Uh, September 11th is now First Responders Day, you know, where all the first responders in town, you know, came to Concord Middle School to kind of just give a high five to the kids as the kids were getting on their bus. So that's a good instance of when there were so many trucks and first responder vehicles at the campus that that notification was very appropriate, of course. But being in the uniform it really allows uh, the students um, a chance and families a chance to see that that you know, should be the norm. Um, and it's not the new normal that the only reason why an officer in uniform would be at the middle school would be because of an emergency or a crisis. And feeling they can approach someone who's in a uniform and not be as intimidated by it. It's really, it's very, it was very interesting. Yeah. Thank you very well. so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. So I actually have two questions. I'm going to back up, Angel, sorry. <laughs> no, that's really just a comment. And um, one you mentioned about um, spread the word about the self program. Oh. Both. Yeah, and both. But specifically, you were talking about that, so I want to cover that with this specific and then all. And this is a question maybe you can take back to your team. Um, and I hear this comment a lot from parents is, if we don't know about something, we don't know to ask for it. So, you know, when a student is struggling with whatever that may be, and I'm going to not go everything, whatever that may be, social, emotional, could be academic, and a parent's not coming through with the process of IP, testing, you know, it's a big, long mm -hmm. process, but you don't necessarily know what to ask for if we don't know something exists. So maybe the question to go back is, how do we provide parents with better communication or some type of communication that these types of programs are available. Mm -hmm. The goal of the school is to offer back to the parent what's mm -hmm. going to be fate. But based on your comment is, again, go back to, we don't know what to ask for if we don't know exist. So how can you make that a, a more accessible thought? So that's not really a question, it's just I have some ideas, can, but mm -hmm. take back as a yeah. team, and I think that would be great um, <coughs> for a lot of parents and just I think so too. Um, the other, and I'm going to go way back, and I know Mike has left, so um, I think you guys can talk about it. And it's kind of two-part, and you talked about 
Open Circle and all the, the wellness and all the programs we're doing. One, how are we holding all the stakeholders accountable for actually grabbing hold of that? And I mean students, parents, teachers, staff, you know, down to homework. If your child comes home with a homework assignment over vacation, what should be our role? To encourage them to do that? Or how are we holding the stakeholders, and I mean everybody, accountable for that? And the other piece was, um, because I see it really building at preschool, Casey talked about preschool and building it up. I think we've missed, and we don't have somebody here from Carlisle, but we also have all our Carlisle students that come in together at the high school. So how are you working together with Carlisle so that we're, you know, you know different feel at different buildings, you talked about that. How are we working with Carlisle to actually integrate all these things that, so that when they come together in the high school, they're coming together with a little bit of the same back. Sorry for so much. No, we'll see. Does that help? Yeah. 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 That's um, a, those are wonderful questions, mm -hmm. and thank yeah. you very much. Uh, so I'll grab the high school one. Mike, Mike did have a name. Yeah. I tried yeah. to spring them all for two yeah. hours. Yeah. Yeah. I came really close. Uh, Mike has to go to a meeting. Uh, so in terms of the, the accountability of the challenge success work, it's so funny you asked me that. Just, just yesterday, Mike and I were each stopped by two different teachers who are on that committee asking exactly that question. So um, it's a discussion point for us, for sure, because those homework policies have been in place the last couple of years. Um, and accountability really means the follow through, right? That we all agree that this is how we're going to practice and then we all actually do practice that way. And I tell you right now, there's nothing more challenging than being a secondary teacher in this learning environment where the, the rigor and the expectations are very, very high and the demand to maintain a pace of curriculum is always at odds with some of these other ideas. And that's a really duplicitous place for most of our uh, high school teachers to be. Um, so the discussion we've had, well one, Mike, Mike's trying to really send messages to the families and community that if, if these practices aren't being followed, they're, they're, we want to know. Um, not because we're tattling on teachers who aren't following, but because we need that feedback. Um, without that feedback loop, and I'm, I preach this everywhere I go, we, only, we can only assume certain messages if we don't get feedback to say otherwise. Um, so that's one message he put out at the beginning of the year, this year to families, was you need to give us that, that feedback if, if the teachers aren't holding to some of those practices. Um, the second piece is going to have to be more structural and institutional. Um, I think, and the conversation I had with the teacher yesterday afternoon um, really turned into a, there's a short-term plan for that, which is accountability. But just the same way when we're holding kids accountable or states holding us accountable, that's only going to master short-term change, right? That's us saying to teachers, we're going to, if we, if we're going to monitor you and it's going to be an external reinforcer. We need to change our practice and our culture in terms of how we're operating, in terms of expectation for kids. There's instructional shifts to be changed. That whole value of what is homework and what are we asking the kids to do anyway is a, is a conversation. So there's short and long-term pieces to that. Um, but that, that's funny to ask because that question was just yesterday. He was asked yesterday morning and before I left, I was on the fourth floor and got stuck by the teachers. So <laughs> it's on their minds too, especially those really inter, in the inner core of that challenge success work. Um, your Carlisle question, I think one of my big uh, objectives the last 18 months is to build that, has been to build that bridge with Carlisle. I meet regularly with Jim O'Shea, superintendent, um, and we're funneling that down so that the high school is reaching out to both middle schools. Justin's working to collaborate more with um, the middle school level at the Carlisle school. Um, it, it, it's starting, I think, at least through Jim and I, where we, we try to know what each other's doing all the time, um, and that's led to... <laughs> feedback over there as to things they're going to consider that we've done and vice versa already and there's certain specific examples to that so um, it's on the radar and I think it's growing I think there's always room to continue to grow because what while we want to be streamlined we don't want to lose the individual identities either so it's you know finding those really prioritized pieces that um, we either need to be doing the same or know we're not doing the same right um, consciously know that it's different rather than the accidental Whoops, Carlisle does that differently, and you know those those kids aren't going to be on the same page as the concrete kids. So um, at least it's purposeful and on the map to be an, an intended practice. Can I just comment really quickly, you know, because I think getting the word out um, as you were sharing about our special education programs is so key, and the role other community agents do. Um, happen to be um, my daughters are both. Uh, go to the doctor at Concord Vanguard, um, Dr. Rostano, who's actually a resident here in Concord. And uh, when you're walking in um, to the weight room, 
there are two letters um, from Concord Public Schools just sharing that, you know, there's special education that's available for very young, you know, babies. My best friend um, has a child who has Downs. And, you know, that was before I actually had children, and I didn't know that early intervention started pretty much at birth. Um, so, you know, the role that other community agents play, um, in my previous uh, district and administration, um, I was asked to attend um, a homeschool session um, at the public library. Um, and in that session, I learned that there was a lot of families uh, who were homeschooling their children that had pretty significant special needs. And there's a law called Child Fund. And that law states very clearly that even if a, a student um, is being homeschooled, he or she is still, um, should, be, have ex access, should have access to special education um, in public schools. Um, I'll end with your point person probably should be the principal in each building. Um, and too often, and it's kind of a cliche, but it's also true that the school secretary knows everything. Um, <laughs> and the school secretary runs the building. <laughs> and, and where, you know, and I, I bow to that. You have to you bow to that. Um, same thing with the custodial staff. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, um, what concerns me sometimes when the school secretary feels that question is they don't know. They don't know the, you know, the um, intimate details of the laws and the rights. Um, so we seem very busy people, um, and I, you know, I'm constantly. You don't just seem busy. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't remember that. laughs> um, and, uh, but I tell my secretaries all the time, you know, when I kind of overhear a conversation, no, no, yeah, no, no. Don't, you know, not that let busy. me take that phone call. <laughs> let me engage, you know, with that family because. You know, I hope we're equipping all of you with an opportunity to get out there in the community and say that you know the schools do play a role here. And you know, how old is your child? Okay, that's a middle school principal. His name is Justin, and you can email. Him. If I could just feedback one last thing uh, about get, getting word out. Um, so, by and large, the principals act as um, team chairs in many of the buildings. So when we are meeting with parents and we have transition meetings every year that we say, I've got something I'd like to propose to you that I'd like you to start to consider. And let's have that conversation. Or the parents will say, Matt, is it true that maybe there's something happening over there? Yes. Three things I think come to mind. One, clear and open communication, collaboration, and at some level, trust. Right? So, and, 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 and when you're dealing, when it's your child, right? That's, honestly, public education is, we as principals look after every last kid in the building. Your job as mom and dad is to look after your child. So there's going to be times in which, Matt, you know, as the parent, I'm not feeling so good. And I need to say, but as the principal, I, if you trust me, we can do this. And so that's what we need to do, too. But it's having that open communication, <coughs> having that sense of collaboration, saying, well, Matt, maybe not this, but how about that? Or can we look at this? And lastly, you have to have some trust in us as we have trust in you that we're working together, honestly. Trust the yeah, and trust the process, right. and have the empathy and the concern and the understanding of people who have children who um, who oh, may uh, who, 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 exactly yeah yeah. So yeah. so so, so yes, I think to, as Laura was saying earlier, building the plane while it's in flight. Number one. So sometimes we're not ready in the place, and we want to put our best foot forward. <laughs> as a parent, you want to hear, "I got the program for you," and let me tell you exactly who the teacher is, and how often it's going to meet, and what room it's going to be in, because that's what you want. That's, that's obvious. What we need to say is, let's start talking about what this might look like. What, what are you thinking? And how does it fit within the profile of your child? And are there others that make sense to bring together? So that's a bit of what we're doing. So yes, we need to get word out. But know that at every time that we gather with parents of, regarding a student whose placement may be different next year, we're talking about this. Yeah. And Kitsy, you had a response, I, I think. So, not a response, just a question. <clears throat> I was a teacher for a long time, and I love hearing all these wonderful programs. We even did open service back in the day. But I'm, I'm always thinking that I know we're talking about one level of student who has significant problems, but there are other students that sort of are these kids that you always hear about. Well, she sort of slipped through the cracks, mm -hmm. or he was so quiet, nobody. And I'm wondering how the schools work with that, because if the teacher is running open circle, she's doing yoga, she's doing all the, <laughs> plus she's teaching the curriculum. And there's some very sweet little kids sitting there, a boy or a girl, who never says anything, seems fine. Sooner or later you start wondering, and how does that 
handled, get handled in the school? Do, are the teachers trained to sort of step up a little more? Do they go to, well, they don't want to go to the principal, the guidance counselor? I don't know. Is Sherry, Angel, I mean, I together? can take the elementary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Angel. And then you can jump on. Sure. So um, at the elementary <coughs> level, we have something um, called, I don't know if you have, do you have a child study at the middle school? Yeah, you do. Okay. So let's say that you have a child who all of a sudden becomes not talkative or you notice something, something's up. So every single week, um, we have a bunch of minds around the table. We have um, teachers of different grade levels. We have the PE teacher. We have the nurse, myself, uh, our counselor. And anyone can come with a child and say, you know what? I want to talk today about this child. And the reason I need some support or I'm trying to figure out what's going on with this child. It could be academically. It could be socially. It could be they've all of a sudden seemed to be um, depressed or they seem anxious or all of a sudden I'm not sure what to do. And so everyone around the table works together to make a plan for how we're going to monitor and support that child. So that happens every single week and then we also monitor them every four to six weeks. So if a child comes up on our radar and because we do it consistently throughout the course of the year, um, we would have enough time to meet to discuss every child. <coughs> um, I always say in Concord kids don't have parents. They certainly don't because we have so many different um, <coughs> systems in place to have our finger on the pulse of what's happening with every kid. And then we have the structures to check in so that that doesn't happen. So that's what I would say on my end. Would you want to add on? So two um, points. Uh, first, just to go back to the accountability piece um, and to refer specifically to Open Circle. Um, at the end of each of the five units that I had mentioned, there's um, a, a series of re reflection tools that the students fill out and then a reflection tool that the teacher fills out too to kind of ensure that there's that accountability of the generalization and the use of the, the skills that are being taught. Um, so that's one piece that I wanted to mention. But referring back to this specific question, um, we have a similar format. Um, there are some slight differences, but um, we call them progress monitoring meetings. And so we meet approximately every six weeks to talk about all students and we discuss academic and social emotional and behavioral needs um, and what we're really honing in on is um, it, if you remember the slide with the pyramid that has um, that's referring to RTI um, we're really looking at what are interventions that we can put into place at the um, tier one level and what is a specific goal that we can hone in on um, and focus on that specific goal um, track data on that specific goal, and then in the, in the next cycle, determine whether or not, through our data, our intervention or strategy has been successful. Um, sometimes it can um, be overwhelming when you look at um, everything that needs to be addressed, and so we're finding that when we hone in on one specific area, that it actually ends up yielding results in other areas, too. Um, so that's kind of our model. In addition, Forward speaking, we are looking at a screener um, for um, Alcott and potentially the other elementary schools as well that will address um, more social, emotional, and behavioral needs because there are a plethora of screeners for academic needs, but um, for the needs that you know we're involved in, um, we're we're trying to find something that will meet our needs so that we can identify those students and then have a specific intervention that matches the screener as well, so we know whether or not okay, the interventions that we're, that we're putting into place are directly related to the screener, so we know that the results from the screener are um, really telling whether or not the intervention itself was what produced the differences. Yeah. Can, can I just add to that? Yeah. I finish with that? Because I feel like you're jumping to level two. Yeah, and you're I'm talking about one. the class. I'm sitting there looking at the class, and I have this lovely chair, and I'm sitting there. She never owns her mouth. <laughs> and after, that probably wouldn't be the real show. No. <laughs> <laughs> and after three months, you start really listening. Now, at that point, I'm not exactly ready to bring her right. before some group. But I'm wondering if the teachers are getting some support themselves and how to. I mean, every kid isn't going to jump into open circle. And, um, no, right. Uh, so really, the structures you're hearing them reference are and ones we're working to really build comprehensively. And I'll talk about secondary in a minute because it's even more challenging Probably when is. they're not in self-contained rooms all day like they are in elementary. The screeners you're hearing about are tools that we use with every child, whether it be academic and reading skills or math skills. And now the, now the kit we're building is the social-emotional skill. So that means every child on a regular basis, usually three times a year, twice a year, depending on the tool, 
participates in these. And this is where, you know, there's a lot of data in our worlds now, and it can be very negative in terms of the high stakes attached. This is where data is positive, because this is data that says to us, this child's doing what I thought they were doing, and here's some backup to show it, or, uh-oh, here's a flag that makes me not so sure now, or what I didn't see is actually turning into a question mark of things I've got to further pursue, because what I thought was solid is actually flagging as something that isn't as solid as it appeared when the student sit and sits and does, does this work individually. So in terms of the academic piece, it's straightforward skill work. The social emotional piece, which we're just getting into really this year, and I happen to peek over the, I, I stopped because it's such a personal tool, but I was peeking over that our freshman class took, took this tool this, that Mike mentioned, um, where it's a lot of personal questions about how do you feel about how do you feel about, and then they're rating their, their sense of themselves in a lot of different ways in terms of the school environment and their peers and their confidence. And that data, I think, is going to be just as important, if not more important, that especially in a secondary world where they're traveling all day and they have multiple teachers, um, that we, we pop those kids who look fine but maybe aren't. And as the parent of an introvert, 16-year-old introvert, I lose sleep on this daily. Because um, I don't want you don't want them to fall through the cracks because you don't know what's going on in their little heads and they're not the precocious one with their hand up all the time and yet they may look just fine because their grades are good and in terms of a teacher they're not flagging themselves so um, making sure that we've got those capacities you know the one little story I'll tell you because we're really in the early stages this is this is a world of fairly uncharted territory at the high school level to try to build these structures in the RTI triangle. Um, even to gather the data, never mind actually do the follow-up work. This fall we gave the, uh, a reading assessment also to all of the freshmen, and there also happened to be a pretty significant discipline issue that day, and guess what? Assistant principal is emailing me by the end of the day going, you know what? The kids we just looked at who are struggling to read were all involved in that discipline issue. <laughs> and it sounds so logical, right? But if we're not screening kids at the high school to make sure they're solid readers still, Imagine being a CC, not reading solidly. Like, I can't even imagine the day there, especially if it's not identified and you're getting support. Um, so it's so important all these tools fit and match each other. Um, we've got work to do in terms of to build the structure, because then we get the data and we go, okay, now we've got an unidentified child with reading needs. What are we going to do? And that needed to get built immediately as well. Um, but to your point, nobody, we don't want anybody to fall through the cracks. We are fortunate enough to be well-resourced and supported and... In parents are engaged and the staff is available and highly trained and professional, it's even more onerous to us to be sure we identify them. So I think we're getting further and further down that pipeline to where we really will know nobody's falling through the cracks. So. Yes, one, we, we, we have a small timing problem. Um, we, we, we're, we're meant to be finished in about five minutes. Um, and there are lots of wonderful questions and I can see them popping up, but I promise Stefan um, and, and then back in the back, yes. I just, I just had a quick question. Oh, about, go ahead then. Oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. No, go ahead then. Go, go ahead. <laughs> um, about the two intensive K2 programs going on at Thoreau. Have you guys rolled out like... One's K2, one's K5. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. right. Sorry. Yeah. So have you guys rolled material or awareness out to like... Obviously, you guys work in tandem very well with the integrated preschool, but to some of the private preschools, because I just... I'm thinking from my own experience, there are a constituency of parents who, for whatever reason, don't sort of take advantage, I think, of the integrated preschool when their kids would probably be better served there than in a really small private, private school. Right. So I think that there are a lot of kids that don't get caught um, in that you know, integrated preschool net, whether they're at you know, one of these private preschools or, or Concord Children's Center because their parents need a more like full-time program. I just didn't know if you guys pushed, rolled we that out. But we will. Yeah. Okay. And we need to. Yeah. Because that's a terrific, that's a, that, you know, and watching our own, um, our own children, um, it, it raise children and looking at all the options and particularly when everybody's working full-time, you know, how are the children cared for and how are they, how is the communication going back and forth between families and schools? I mean, the complexity of this world right now um, you know, requires all of our efforts. Um, and the last question goes to Stefan. Thank you. Um, there was some discussion earlier about how some of these programs are uh, reducing costs in the long term, but it's going to take the long term before you really see that. Um, 
how do you see this tying in, if at all, to changes in the foundation budget and that are coming up <laughs> in the legislature this year? I was so hoping to talk about money before I left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I left my business manager is the only one not here today, and I'm like, I am so thrilled to not bring you with me. Um, so I think, I'll, I'll add, we are seeing savings already. Um, that's pretty exciting for us. The trick is I'm turning, taking those savings and spending them to create another program. So we're using the cash flow um, because we are keeping kids in district and now we're starting to build a list of kids that potentially might be able to come back from another setting. Um, and then we're really re-looking at our allocations of um, staffing and how we're using people and making sure our services are targeted um, to what kids need. So there is some savings going on already. Um, we brought in really reasonable budgets this year, much because of that, but I am spending a lot of it just as quickly in trying to be cost neutral while we create these programs. Um, but over time, really the big ticket place we're looking at um, savings, I think, is the out-of-district tuitions, which aside from the staff, is the biggest driver of the budget and frankly the most volatile. Um, and we want to do right by kids, but we're always doing right by kids with that, you know, that umbrella of, oh, do we have the money for this? And I, it's a very challenging, um, difficult, unfortunate, I won't get into my whole wishing it wasn't set up this way, um, which I guess maybe you give me the avenue to do that on the foundation budget. Um, there is a big effort right now underway. The Superintendents Association is very, very involved in efforts to try to get that um, ancient formula of the foundation budget uh, reform happening. Um, I feel very fortunate as I watch all of them post an email and I'm in Concord where we don't rely on that budget extensively. It's, it's, it's a healthy chunk of money, but it's not like some of the urban settings where it's really the bulk of the money they're working with. Um, it's an ancient formula that doesn't factor in a lot of the really complex pieces of schools and communities and um, the needs of what happens. So Massachusetts has essentially created this have and have not thing because the local funding is driving essentially the quality of the schools. You're not really, you know, we're not surprised to hear that, but as you really look at some of the visible ways that's um, being portrayed in some of the campaign and lobbying going on up at the State House, it's startling, frankly, to me. And again, I keep watching going, oh, I am so grateful to be in a place where mm -hmm. the resources are, are not state subsidized <coughs> completely. And I lived in other districts where um, my first, my 14 years as principal was all about, you know, we were having town meeting in June because we needed those numbers coming out of the state to see what our budget was going to be. Um, but the urban centers is a whole other drive. So I, I think as a community, we always have to pay attention to all levels because while I say we're so fortunate, every 100,000 or so, you know, it all matters. It all matters. What we can do with $100,000 of available money is create a new program because now I can hire another teacher. Um, so there's always a, a reason to stay tuned to the state level. Um, right now, it's a it's a it, The formula keeps getting stuck in the House and the Senate, and they can't get to an agreement on what to do next. And that's been a long time story. Um, so we're hoping. Everybody's looking at me. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even met yet, but uh, <laughs> we, we would love to see some movement there. There's no question. So. Because uh, whether it's a minimal <laughs> positive impact to us or it's the major impact that my sister and sisters and brothers in the urban districts need is a really, really important discussion. Um, in terms of us as a local group, we've done a lot of budget work this year at both districts at, at the school level. We zero-based budgeted, which means we blew both budgets up and started from scratch this fall. Um, my new business manager, Jared Stanton, and his staff and the people that you've been listening to talk education, had to dive in really deep and um, start all over again in the budgets that we created and put forward. And we did find savings there. Um, what continues to happen is reorganization and reallocation. And before I left here, I was in his office talking about copiers and cartridges of ink and like, okay, what is our master plan? Because there's gotta be a better way to do this than the way we're doing it. So we're in that mindset and we're, we are definitely reaping benefits and gains. Um, we're at the FinCom guideline for the regional budget at four. See, I'm, I'm so lost when he's not with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at my school committee. Four, six, one. Four, four point six, six, one. Four the regional six. budget is so complicated with uh, all of the variables that go into that because it's insurance and OPEP and all of that. But we're, we've got a really solid level service budget there. We are not at the FinCom guideline at 
the Concord School one, um, their guideline is at 2.6. We brought in a 2.9 budget, which I feel pretty strongly it's a solid budget, and we're going to ask to continue that conversation with them. Um, and that was with a lot of high-cost drivers that we brought in a level service budget under 3%. So what that means in terms of local Concord is a sustainability conversation that we're very invested in having with the Finance Committee and all of you at large. Um, we've identified, I think, a conflict of expectation of service and willingness to pay and what that's going to look like down the road. And that's not just a school conversation, that's a town level yeah. conversation as well. So um, we're really excited by, about the financial work we've been doing because we really can account for all dollars right now. <coughs> and where they're going. And it's kind of fun when you recreate a way to do things and not only is it better for kids and adults, but it saves money too. So <laughs> thank you for the money conversation. <laughs> Justin has to say yeah, one, one last talk, word. Yeah, remark very quickly um, on what we're doing at the secondary level to really get the word out. Um, we can't end on money. Sorry, Lori. Uh, <laughs> I'm good with that. I do not. You know, but because I think one of the takeaway that I think you know this team is going to take walking out of the library is just you know we seem to have a group here of supreme advocates um, and ambassadors for public education, which you know we're so thankful for that. So, you know, to answer your question about what are we doing and what can you all do to get the word out, um, you know, I just secured dates um, with the elementary folks to visit each elementary school at the end of February to share out the big changes that are happening at the middle school. Um, we're turning the Peabody building into an all sixth grade building. We think that's what's best academically and social and emotionally for that age of child. And we're turning the Sam Warren building into a seventh and eighth grade all um, building as well. We do need one building, um, but that's, that's where we're I going. wondered if it would come that's up. That's where we're going in the next couple of years. Um, and you know, I think it's important when I was scheduling those. Yeah, when I was scheduling those dates, um, my wife was sitting next to me or emailing you know these folks whether or not their auditoriums were going to be available. You know, my my wife remarked, you know, it's great that you're getting this information out um, and you're going to email fifth grade families this information, but you know, invite the fourth grade. You know, by fifth grade, end of February, they may have already made that choice, you know, to attend that private school or, you know, to go a different route. So, you know, that's why I've emailed these folks to ask for a bigger room than we had last year when the middle school does attend and have a parent forum at the end of February for now fourth grade and fifth grade families. So that you are getting that word out about how we're doing things different and the special education piece is going to be a part of that. Thank you, Thank so, you much. Justin, so much. Um, we're so grateful for your time, uh, for your for the, for the work you do for our children, um, for the energy that you bring to things. Sharon, when I, I'm an educator and I spent my life in schools, and I first heard a, a, a superintendent of schools in New York City talk about the fact that, and this was about 20 years ago, um, he said, we have over 54 languages um, in, in the schools in New York City, and I thought, 54 languages, my gosh, how do they cope? And now we hear in Concord that there are over 30 different languages, and that a third of those students go home to homes that, where English is not the primary language. Um, it's a changing world, uh, and it's our collective responsibility to continue to try to educate ourselves um, about how our schools are doing it and to support them in that process. I thank Edie again for her fine work, Julie and Carl and, and Heather. Um, for the work that you've all done to, to pull this together. Thank you so much. Um, oh, and Susan, of course. <laughs> Thank you.